Heights Board of Education on July 22nd at 7 p.m. As a reminder, we are holding this meeting using video conferencing technology. The Ohio General Assembly and Attorney General have approved the use of virtual meetings as a viable alternative to conducting public meeting hearings during this time, and the district's alternative complies with the new statutory directives. Uh, we will be broadcasting this meeting via our Grandview Heights YouTube channel. The link to the YouTube channel is currently available on the district's website. The live stream of this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the district's website. Please also be advised that Board of Education meetings are not hearings, they are meetings. We are in full compliance with House Bill 197 by having our meeting live stream so that members of the public can observe and hear the discussions and deliberations of the board. This meeting will not include an executive session. Um, so we will just go into adjournment at the end. Beth, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie. Present. Mrs. Gephardt. Present. Mr. Gousset. Here. Mr. Truitt. Here. And Ms. Wasmuth. Here. Okay, so uh, one of the nice things about using the platform that we're using is that we are able to um, allow people to participate in public participation. So I'm gonna read that statement as I would do just at a, uh, a, um, an in-person meeting. Uh, obviously there's not a podium in this situation, but other than that, the board recognizes the value of public comment to school governance. If you wish to address the board, you may speak now or directly before an action item that you would like to address. A copy of board policy is in the board meeting packet. When addressing the board, please follow the following um, guidelines. State your name and address for the record, limit comments to five minutes or less, direct statements to the board, do not mention students or staff by name, and maintain reasonable decorum. The board will hear, will hear statements but will not answer questions or engage in debate during the board meeting. I as board president, Andy Kalp as superintendent, Beth Collier as a treasurer, or I believe any board member would be happy to meet with any member of the public to answer specific questions pertaining to Grandview Heights School. So just to be clear, um, we have public, uh, the order of the agenda is that we have uh, public participation now, and then Mr. Kalp will give his presentation on the learning plan for 2021, which then later in the agenda, the board will approve. So um, for the folks that wish to speak, uh, you can certainly do that now, or if you would prefer to do it after the presentation and before the action item, uh, we did have one request for that. And so we will offer and honor that request for all of our folks uh, that want to do public participation. I believe we have five this evening in that category. Shall I begin? Yes, please. All right. Um, Mr. Uh, Doug Page, Mr. Page um, has requested to speak. Mr. Page, would you like to speak now or would you like to speak before an action item? Mr. Page? Yes. Would you like to speak now or would you like to speak before an action item? I can speak at this time if that is okay. That's perfect. Would... Thank you, Mr. Page. All right. <clears throat> I want to take a moment to thank the Granby Heights Board of Education, Superintendent Cole, Haley Head, and the Granby Heights community for allowing me a few moments to speak this morning or this evening. As the president of the Granby Heights Education Association, I have the distinct honor of serving a hundred teachers throughout this wonderful district. As you can imagine, the last six months have been an extraordinary time for to be a teacher. During this time, teachers not only have met the expectations set forth by our administration, but in many ways far exceeded these expectations. The closures due to COVID challenged and stretched teachers to adapt quickly to distance learning. As teachers look to the school year, we will be learning how to create collaborative learning experiences design and facilitate effective, engaging and impactful lessons, provide rich and meaningful student feedback to grow student learning and find ways to engage students to make learning authentic. On top of that, we are expected to pivot teaching and learning from one model to another quickly and efficiently. I asked for time this evening to share with you how our teachers feel about the start of the school year. One way GHEA was able to capture these thoughts was through a teacher survey that was given over a week ago. The survey results have been given to Superintendent Culp and shared with the Grandview Heights Board of Education. This survey reflects the feelings and concerns of 87 of our teachers who responded to this survey. 
The main reason for the survey was to seek input on the three-tier plan that is being discussed for opening up the school year. The survey was scaled from one to five. One indicates a teacher's feelings of not comfortable at all, and five indicates a teacher's feelings very comfortable. We had teachers rate one to five, their comfort level with going to an in-person hybrid and distance learning model. Within these models, teachers selected the highest comfort ratings with an average of 3.43 for the distance model and a comfort rating of 3.28 for the hybrid model. The lowest comfort rating average was 2.26 for an in-person model. While the distance in a hybrid model shows similar averages, there is much more uncertainty in the comfort ratings of the hybrid model. More, many more teachers rated a one out of five as a comfort rating in the hybrid model than in the distance model. Another question that was asked was rate how you feel about trying to delay the start of the school year so that we may have work days to prepare for teaching in a new setting, assuming the numbers of Central Ohio remain elevated. The average score was a four out of five in the comfort level in supporting and delaying the beginning of the school year to allow teachers time to develop a distance and or hybrid curriculum. Teachers responded that they were much more comfortable when delaying the start of school for students so teachers can have work days to develop an online and hybrid curriculum. Yet another question asked, how important do you believe the Ohio Department of Health County risk level assessment should be used to make decisions about the pathways we follow this year? The average score was a 4.48 out of five, showing the comfort level with using the Ohio Department of Health County risk level assessment to make decisions about the pathway we follow this year. There is a very strong feeling amongst teachers that we follow the assessment to make decisions. Finally, we ask according to the CDC, people who are older and who have an underlying health condition are considered high risk for con contracting COVID. Those underlying health conditions include obesity, COPD, chronic kidney disease, organ transplant, sickle cell disease, heart conditions, and type two diabetes. Do they feel they are at high risk? 27 teachers of the 87, that's 31% of the members who responded feel that they are in a high risk category. This indicates that during in-person instruction, we could see a substantial number of teachers desiring a medical leave or some other accommodations to lessen the risk of exposure. Needless to say, <clears throat> there has been many anxious discussions about how to reopen our school in a way that is healthy and safe for students and staff. Let me stress how important that statement is. How will we be able to reopen our school in a healthy and safe way for all students and all staff? It is our hope that the board carefully considers the views and feelings of the teaching staff when making a decision as to what the school year will look like. The survey reflects those who would be the ones on the front lines in our school buildings in the upcoming fall. I wanna thank the board again and Mr. Culp for the time that you've given me. Thank you. Our next speaker are we ready for our next speaker? Is Juliana Christ. Ms. Christ, would you like to speak now or would you like to speak before the action item? An action item. Hi, yes, my comments are related to the, the COVID vote tonight on how we'll be proceeding. So I'll wait until the action item comes up and speak then. Thank you. Thank you. Our next um, request to speak is from Robin Amacon. Ms. Amacon, would you like to speak now or would you like to speak before an action item? Hello, thank you. I, I'd like to wait, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Our next request is from Patricia Zettler. Ms. Zettler, would you like to speak now or prior to an action item? Uh, we don't have Ms. Zettler on just yet. I'll let you know if she appears. Okay, thank you. Um, our next uh, individual requesting to speak is Matt Palmisciano. Mr. Palmisciano, would you like to speak now or before an action item? I'd like to speak now, please. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, go ahead. Uh, Matthew Pomachano, 1376 Wyandotte. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of you on the call, uh, the board, uh, the administration, and the staff. Uh, I know that you're all working extremely hard in this difficult time. And uh, as a community member, I certainly appreciate uh, all the efforts you've made. Uh, as many of you know, I have, I have children in all three schools this year. Um, and uh, this, is, this is an interesting uh, time. Uh, our youngest uh, really needs the structure of full day uh, care or, or education. Uh, and our oldest uh, wants to really experience all there is to, that is offered by the high school. Uh, I think certainly losing the spring and, and potentially the fall uh, is critical time that's not gonna be able to be made up. And uh, I certainly want my voice to be heard that uh, as an advocate for full uh, return to school, uh, if possible. As you all know, Grandview is a unique uh, area. Uh, and I see this as a great opportunity to take advantage of that unique situation. You know, we have small classes, we have no busing, and we have flexibility that's not available to almost any other district uh, in Ohio. Uh, so, you know, obviously we all have to look at the risk. Uh, I pulled some information from the American Council on Science and Health. Uh, it's all pulled from the CDC website. Uh, and this information is from February 1st this year to June 17th. Uh, from uh, the age group from zero to 14 years of age, there, uh, in that time period, there were 26 deaths attributed to COVID versus uh, just under 9,000 deaths uh, across that age group during the same time period. In the 15 to 24 age group, so our high school kids in, in uh, college, there were 125 deaths uh, attributed nationwide to COVID versus uh, just under 11,000 deaths uh, nationwide in that age group during the same period. So clearly the, the, the risk to our students uh, from a death perspective is uh, it, it's quantifiable. And I think certainly something uh, that we should, as a, as a board, I hope you would take into consideration uh, tonight. Uh, you know, from the survey that we talked about during the last board meeting, parents were overwhelmingly in the district uh, advocates of bringing their children back to school. Uh, the data says that it's relatively safe for our children to return. And I think it's most important that this district is providing an opportunity for, for families and parents who disagree that it's safe to return a, a distance learning model supported by Grandview teachers that allows them to make decisions which are best for their family, but may not be best for the overall community by having their children go to a distance education model for the foreseeable future. You know, our, our children need to go back to school full time. The parents overwhelmingly want their children to go back to school full time. And our district has a unique ability to bring them back to school full time. Going back to school full time is going to certainly be a difficult and hard choice for the board tonight but I certainly think it's the right choice. Uh, I hope uh, you uh, consider my uh, comments during the deliberations and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Pomachano. Um, we have, uh, I've received um, a request for the login information um, from Mrs. Zettler, Patricia Zettler. Um, so we may um, be asking her uh, in a moment, I'll re uh, circle back to see when she would like to make comments. Is um, our next requester to speak is Melissa Palmashano. Are you logged in? Yes, I am. Okay, M Mrs. Palmashano, would you like to speak uh, now during public participation or prior to an action item? Prior to the action item, please. All right, thank you. Uh, and then, like I said, um, Mr. Truitt, Ms. Zettler was just sent the login information. Do we want to take a second to see if she logs in? Um, you know, uh, we can certainly give her the opportunity to speak when the others want to uh, before okay. the action item. I'm assuming that the action item will be the vote for the Grandview Heights plan for, for learning for 2020-2021. So uh, certainly we want to offer that opportunity, but I, I do want to, um, we have a lot to get through, so I want to continue to move right. forward. I will okay. notify her that we will um, circle back to her and she will have an opportunity to speak. Oh, thank you. Next on the agenda is um, a recommendation and presentation from Mr. Culp and his team. Uh, before we get into that uh, quickly, I do wanna say uh, a very large thank you um, to all the different groups that have providing input. Um, Mr. Page, I, I appreciate the fact that you gave us that specific, gave those specific survey results to the entire board. Uh, we have read 
and considered those and those were helpful. Uh, the community survey results, um, the entire board got every single one of those results uh, individually and have read and considered those. Uh, I certainly appreciate the vast amount of uh, emails and input that, that we have received and, and also I want to thank Mr. Culp and his team for who, who have constantly been in contact with local health, health professionals. Um, everyone's input is certainly important. I've been uh, more than impressed with the amount of well thought out input from medical professionals in our community. Um, I felt like when we were in a facilities project, you couldn't look twice without seeing an architect. And I've, I've changed that to a, a medical professional. It's, it's really amazing the wealth of knowledge. And frankly, it's also, um, interesting the the variety of of input um you you would sort of imagine that that all that input would be the same and and i've said if i printed out all that input and put it in stacks based on on where we are uh they might be uh, relatively even so so but i know on the on on behalf of the entire board i uh, want to thank everybody um you know people often ask me the most important uh um um factor to have being a board member, it's willing to put in the time. And I know that everybody, I, I thank my colleagues on the board who have put the hours and hours and hours into to reading the thoughtful input that we've got. And Mr. Kolp, I know you and your team have done the same and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation and your recommendation. So thank you, Mr. Truitt. Uh, I do have a few comments before I share my screen and the corresponding presentation. Uh, first and foremost, just wanted to let everybody know that the PowerPoint presentation I'll be sharing tonight will be posted on our website tomorrow, as well as a link will be emailed out to all of our parents. Uh, I want to begin by reading a quote from one of my all-time favorite movie series called The Lord of the Rings, and the quote's by J.R.R. Tolkien. And for me, this quote captures how I've felt over the last many months and perhaps how some of you have felt. And the quote goes like this. I wish it not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf. And so do all who live to see such times. But this is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with this time that is given to us. Like probably many of you, I wish we were not in this situation that we find ourselves. I know I speak for our entire staff, the Board of Education, GHEA, families and students, that we want to be back in school every day, all day. The challenge, of course, simply put, is balancing the social, emotional, behavioral, and of course, our academic needs with and for our students against the desire to do the right thing with and for our students and keeping them safe with regard to COVID-19. These are hard and difficult decisions. I thank all of those in the community who have sent me so many emails, their perspectives, views, articles, research, and their personal experiences and insights. I have earnestly tried to respond and read every single word. And I thank you for the time and professional manner in which you've conveyed those emails to me. Know that this has and will continue to weigh heavily on me and all involved in our organization. And we are committed to do our very best to provide a safe environment. Safety is critically important in our analysis as well as rich learning opportunities, regardless of the phase. Know that I fully understand the real anxiety and fear that many have expressed to me they are feeling as a father of three th sons and a wife who is a first responder at Children's Hospital, I really do get it on a personal and professional level. The Franklin County Board of Health has reviewed our most current plan and has strongly recommended that we follow the governor's color-coded system. We therefore will be using that as an indicator, but not the indicator. We will also be assessing daily, hourly COVID spread locally and our students and families. Recently, we sent our 30 page document entitled Grandview Heights Schools Plan for Learning 2020 2021 to garner feedback from our community. I thank all of you in the community and our parents for their feedback and the seriousness and professional manner in which everyone provided the feedback. As evidenced by the ever changing landscape that we're in, since we sent our plan out for feedback, COVID 19 rates have changed and are increasing dramatically. 
we are going to have to be able to adapt and adjust to our situation in Franklin County and locally in Grandview community. Adapt and adjust. We believe that it is important to be well prepared for all three scenarios for a myriad of reasons, not the list of which is what I just mentioned. The landscape is dynamic and it is changing. I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation for the board today that they will consider approving. Their approval of this plan does place an emphasis on the governor's color-coded system. Based on the governor's color-coded system and Franklin County Health Department's strong recommendation to use this to determine what option our district should be in, provided the board approves the PowerPoint plan today, our district will be in a hybrid school setting if we were to start school today. This, of course, could change if there is a spike in COVID cases or spread locally whereby Franklin County moves to purple or there is a major outbreak or an outbreak among our students, our staff, our community. Uh, so both of those two data points are gonna be used to evaluate that. I will, re I will be reviewing each of our current plans shortly. And the two choices family, families and students will need to make are one, first, the school-based option, full day school setting with significant student and safety protocols in place. Number two, our AM, PM hybrid model. And number three, our distance learning. And then the second choice the families will have to make will be to choose if they're not comfortable, for example, in this instance, were we to return today in a hybrid model, the Florida Virtual Learning Academy. The three-step process we've engaged our staff, students, and parents in is data and research, design and planning, and then now we are arriving at the decision and recommendation to the Board of Education today. We are currently in the decision phase of our outline process. This meeting marks the fourth time the Board of Education has reviewed our plans, given feedback, and part of our public board work sessions. Our process has also included a student, staff, and parent surveys and additional feedback loops, as well as a meeting with and many additional email exchanges with a group of physicians that live in and have students attending Grandview Heights schools. Importantly, we are also regularly consulting with and getting guidance in all ways from the Franklin County Department of Health. We have been working hard as a leadership team to be fully prepared to deliver our state admission in all three scenarios. We owe it to our students and our community to be well prepared for all three possible scenarios and are committed to delivering our state admission. We believe that we can and will better meet the needs of our students in a distance learning environment than what we were able to deliver this past spring, given the time, energy, and effort that we have collabor collaboratively given to this in addition to the structures and accountability measures for students. I want to personally thank our teachers who have been fantastic collaborators, and I appreciate their honest, reflective, growth-minded approach throughout this unprecedented time. I appreciate their partnership throughout this process. This is important always, but in this time, it is even more pronounced. I wanted to personally thank our principals and our leadership team and our amazing, uh, again, our amazing teachers for their work in all ways in creating these three robust plans. I also want to thank our Board of Education for their tireless work and dedication, hours and hours upon hours in preparing and reading all of the latest and greatest research. And I am truly, truly appreciative in all ways for that. Chris, I need permission to share my screen. Uh, working on that now. I want to begin by talking about some of the safety precautions that we're going to take. First and foremost, we're going to create a system whereby we will require all staff and students to report their temperature before they come to school. 
Uh, this is the strong recommendation of the Franklin County Health Department and creating such a system as a requirement for attendance will mitigate uh, figuring out that they actually have a temperature after they've already been on site and interacted with other students. So we are in the process of creating, whether it will be a Google Doc or an app that will link to each building or the teacher's assigned uh, or the student's assigned teacher or the student's homeroom so that we're reporting on a daily basis as a requirement for attendance, the students and staff's temperature. Face masks will be a requirement K-12. Physical distance guidelines followed with six feet separation when possible and at least three feet in classrooms with masks. Hand sanitizers, both a, um, a, a hand activated, sensor activated, hand sanitation wall mount will be in every classroom as well as in all of the common areas throughout every building. Additionally, we will also have a large hand pump uh, sanitizer in the event that the sensor activation battery wears out or one or that one runs out, we'll have a backup in place. We're gonna have cleaning supplies to sanitize work areas and available throughout the day as well as placed in every classroom. Additional safety precautions will include a no visitor or volunteer policy, no shared student supplies. We are going to ask that students not use lockers to mitigate interaction between and among students. One way hallways where possible. Lunch and breakfast will all be grab and go, individually wrapped. No field trips until further notice. No large group student events where six feet distancing isn't possible. Uh, kids club will be in session before and after school unless we are in the distance learning phase. As mentioned earlier, um, and as a reminder, plans are and will remain at this moment. I had mentioned in my opening comments that were we to open school today, we would be in a hybrid setting. That is as of today. We will continue to reevaluate based on evolving conditions, data based on status of the pandemic, the governor's COVID-19 color codes coded system and recommendations and guidance from public health officials and data specific to our students in Grandview and staff in Grandview. I outlined and mentioned earlier our process um, and as mentioned, we are in the decision phase. And so should the board uh, pass the proposed plan, this proposed plan, um, then we would be in a hybrid setting. One of the things I didn't mention was this notion of resource allocation. And I just wanted to quickly mention that a few of the things that we put in place that do come at a cost are we're, we are going to have a building sub for each building. Masks for students and staff, should they not have them, we will be asking that uh, students and staff, if they're able, provide their own. Um, but we will have backup masks available and in stock for anyone that doesn't bring one. Hand sanitizers, as mentioned, cleaning and disinfectant products in every classroom. We're also purchasing plexiglass dividers for every classroom. And we are also adding an additional custodian. Importantly, the governor has made it clear that each school system and perhaps each school building will likely look different this fall. We also know that Ohio has a long history of local control, and that is the case here now. I wanted to mention the American Academy of Pediatrics that put an emphasis on uh, the social, emotional, behavioral, and academic well being, and the corresponding benefits to being physically present in school. Um, and I think that is important to mention. Uh, additionally, they did uh, walk back some of their comments and uh, ensure that the recommendations must be based on evidence and not politics. We are requiring all students K-12 and staff to wear a mask. Um, there will be a appeal process for face coverings and that'll be run through our district nurse. We ask if a student or staff member has a medical reason for which they're not able to wear a mask that they let the nurse and fill out the appropriate forms so that we can excuse them from that requirement. 
So our learning models, as mentioned, are in-person, in buildings, five days a week, a hybrid and a distance. And then option two, of course, as mentioned earlier, will be the Florida Virtual Learning Academy. This is a different example, different uh, visual, but it basically outlines the same thing that the previous slide did. Gives you the three options in terms of the full day, hybrid, distance learning, and then a choice of, for example, Today, if we were to start school, we'd be in a hybrid model. If parents would prefer, they can take advantage of the Online Learning Academy, which is Florida Virtual Learning Academy. This is uh, currently the criteria we'll be used as an indicator, not the indicator for pivoting from one plan to another. We will be also using data specific to Grandview Heights schools. Um, so in essence, what we've done here is, is for level one and level two, we would be in person. For level three, which is red, we would be in a hybrid model, which is our AM, PM model. Everyday attendance, I think it's A through K goes in the AM, uh, L through Z goes in the PM. And then should we move to purple, we will seriously evaluate moving to distance learning. So importantly, should we be in school every day? Safety and adherent, adhering to our safety requirements is going to be critical. So as mentioned earlier, we will have parents assess student health before school and require as a, in order to attend that day, uh, we'll have a mechanism likely either a Google form or a Google doc. We're also looking at an app so that they can report uh, each student's attendance each and every day. You know, I am going to just take a moment and uh, because I'm guessing there are a lot of community members and parents watching today. You know, whether we're in a hybrid or a traditional school setting now more than ever, um, I'm going to make a plea that if your son or your daughter is not feeling well and is symptomatic, has a headache, has a runny nose, is no longer able to taste food, is ha having difficulty breathing, let alone has a temperature. It is paramount that you not send your son or daughter to school. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm saying the same thing to staff members. Face masks will be required K-12 as a district expectation. In fact, on the board agenda today is a required K-12 face mask policy. We're going to have hand sanitizers, both uh, sensor activated as well as a pump activated uh, hand sanitizers in every classroom. We'll be asking students to hand sanitizers before and at the conclusion of every class period or on an hourly basis. One way hallways and stairwells where possible, enhanced disinfectant of services, as mentioned, grab and go lunch, no shared student supplies, lockers restricted or unavailable, uh, no, vis no, no visitors or volunteers in a traditional all-day setting. No field trips until further notice. We are also going to assign by grade, grade level entrances, in, entrances and exits so as to mitigate congregating in a single entryway. When it comes to our AMPM hybrid model, um, this will have 50% of the students attending in AM and 50% attending in the PM on a daily basis will be able to meet uh, six to three feet social distancing in the classroom, again, with the requirement of wearing masks. Um, there are schedules specific to the hybrid model for each building that were published in the 30-page document that we emailed out and asked for feedback on. A through K will attend in the AM, L through Z will attend in the PM, every day. We do ask, unless there is an emergency, these assignments need to be adhered to. You know, I have had a couple requests asking me if we can change, you know, I, uh, you know, for example, my last name ends with a Z and uh, it would be really helpful because, and, and again, I'm just generalizing here. One of his best friends, his last name starts with a C. Um, and the reality is that our ability to manage those requests in this situation is just beyond challenging. And, and quite candidly, um, I'm wired in such a way that from an integrity standpoint, if I, if I allow it for one, I have to allow it for all. And correspondingly, uh, we just can't manage and accommodate all those individual requests. While I do understand, we just can't manage it.
Additional uh, parent, we're, again, these are very similar to what I've already outlined. I'm not gonna repeat them, but the, the safety protocols in the hybrid are gonna be very similar, if not identical in almost all ways with respect to the traditional school setting. So our distance learning model, I, again, I mentioned earlier how proud I was of our teaching staff and our leadership team and creating significantly more synchronous learning opportunities and structures for kids and accountability for students. Um, so it, I do want to mention a couple things here, because as you disaggregate and think about the nuances of the reality, it could be that we could go to a distance learning and that that plan may apply to a single class, a building or an entire district, depending upon Franklin County Board of Health's recommendations and what the exposure was in, in, in a case by case basis. Um, the school transitions from an in person to distance learning at home. Um, you know, are going, it could be uh, within 24 hours or even that day uh, based on the situation in the council and collaboration with the Franklin County Health Department. Academic expectations in full force, including grading and reporting, student code of conduct applies, school and community well being supports will be maintained, schools, campus, campus, and classrooms will be restricted, no large group student events or performances. Importantly, if we do move to distance learning, no interscholastic athletic contest or extracurricular activities, no field trips. Special education services may be adjusted. Attendance will be required and taken daily during synchronous learning events. So option two, or the choice for families is our online academy. Um, we did spend some time researching a myriad of virtual learning academies and we landed on the Florida Virtual Learning Academy. Um, they've been around for 25 plus years. They provide, uh, it, we, we felt like it was the best fit to Grandview Heights schools. Uh, it will be facilitated or case managed by a Grandview Heights teacher, but the pace and curriculum and uh, grades will be assigned by the Florida Virtual Learning Academy and the corresponding teacher that, that is assigned to your student taking this option. Presently, families choosing for their children to remain at home will receive 100% full-time virtual learning, will be able to assess online courses through Florida Virtual Learning Academy, specializing in online learning paid for by the district uh, pending satisfactory progress of course completion. Students will have the opportunity to take grade level appropriate courses provided by Florida Virtual Learning Academy. A GHS teacher will monitor instruction and progress. Currently, our plan is to use our two media center specialists to monitor and collaborate with those families and students. Uh, as of today, we had approximately 30 students assigned for this option. I will tell you, I've probably got at least a dozen, if not 20 emails in the last week indicating that there are more parents that do want to take advantage of this. And uh, while I'm getting ahead of myself, um, we, will, we will be sending out another email tomorrow asking if you'd like to enroll in this option. We are going to be flexible with regard to moving from this option, if you choose it as a family, this option and returning to whether it's a distant learning model or a hybrid model, uh, we are going to be flexible. However, we do recommend that families and students try and commit to either a trimester or a quarter. And we say that, um, again, we're going to be flexible, but we say that more because that transition at that time period would be best for the student. Um, so importantly, I wanted to mention that. Students will be able to participate in district athletics, extracurricular activities, and after school function in accordance with the same eligibility and health guidelines required for all their students in our district. Students will not come to the school building for instruction and will not be in the same classes or have the same teachers as students attending in-person school. The online curriculum will meet the same standards as our Grandview Heights schools curriculum, but it will not necessarily match the same pacing or activities that are delivered in school buildings. Students will have access to courses in all core areas, English, language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. 
Students may have limited access to special areas, K-5, or elective courses, 612. Electives originally chosen by students in grades 612 may not be available in this online platform. Adjustments will be made as necessary. Grades earned in the online learning platform for high school credit will calculate in the student's grade point average and will appear on the student's transcript. Daily supports of students by a parent guardian at home may be required in this learning program. If state and local regulations require a school closure, students participating in this option will continue uninterrupted in using the same online curriculum and platform. Students remain subject to all policies and procedures under the Grandview Heights schools while attending school virtually, should they choose this option. So next steps for families. If you are interested as a student or a family in participating in option one, and currently, as I mentioned today, that would be our hybrid model, there's no action step required uh, to in-person as much as possible by Franklin County Health. However, if you are going to choose option two, in order to move our planning process forward, we need to know which families intend to keep their children at home for the 2020-2021 school year. And, and quite frankly, uh, as all of you are, I'm guessing most of you know, we did send uh, a, a survey trying to garner what the interest was in our community to take advantage of this. However, we fully recognize that that was uh, three weeks ago and the landscape has changed today. And not only has the landscape changed, you have more information today uh, with respect to what we're doing uh, and how we're doing it and what safety protocols we have in measure. And so correspondingly, tomorrow, we will be sending in a second email out uh, that basically is going to ask if you, are, if you can, would like to take advantage of the Florida Virtual Learning Academy as an option. We ask that you respond to this email by July 29th. Um, so that would be a next step for families uh, if you are interested in option two, which is the Florida Virtual Learning Academy. So back to school orientation and events. So family events, student conferences, curricula meetings, IEP, TR meetings will be held virtually. School events such as dances and performances, choir band, strings, theater will either be altered or canceled based on the guiding principles of three to six feet of social distancing and mask wearing at all times. So, you know, Rob Brown and myself have had uh, extensive conversations with, well, not, we've had conversations with Chris Herman and Andrew Grega about choir. Um, we've talked also with the Franklin County Health Department about theater. Um, choir and band seem to be some of the ones that uh, are causing, understandably so, um, some more pronounced challenges. Um, and so we're continuing to collaborate with the Franklin County Health Department, uh, and we're researching uh, how and what that could look like. And I know I speak for both Chris Herman and, and Andrew Grega when I say, you know, they've already plan they've already got a plan B and a plan C in place, but suffice it to say, um, both of them want to have band and choir uh, and keep it the same to the degree to which they can provide safe uh, students doing that safely. We are going to continue to have school supports for our students to include school counselors, school psychologists. We also have a myriad of mental health specialists, prevention clinicians, and other community-based supports to include Centero counseling. You know, we, we fully understand that uh, this is causing a lot of anxiety, not only among staff, but of stu among students. And so I know this team of remarkable people are, gonna, are, are already working and collaborating with best practices and have plans put in place to help support our students during this unprecedented time. Some of the enhanced cleaning protocols. So we, we're gonna, we purchased disinfectant supplies and we're gonna make them available in every single classroom. We've uh, created a cleaning schedule of high touch areas in all classrooms and schools between the AM and PM in the hybrid model. And there'll be intense cleaning nightly. We're shifting custodian schedules, grounds crew schedules and parapros will be helping clean between the AM and PM hybrid sessions. Uh, and additionally, we hired an additional custodian. Some of our COVID positive protocols, and, and I'll tell you, um, 
these have changed uh, in the last two weeks. They've changed twice. So initially, individuals uh, who were COVID positive needed to be isolated for 10 days, and that now has shifted to 10 before returning to school symptom free. Uh, contact tracing will be conducted by Franklin County Health Department. Any person who is considered exposed, and by exposed, that is within six feet with or without a mask for more than 15 minutes, will, will be quarantined for 14 days, symptoms monitored. Again, we're asking families to monitor child's health each day. We're gonna create a system, whether it's a Google Doc, Google app, a Google form, or an app uh, to report daily uh, your son, daughter's fever. Um, the duration of stay at home, this is another thing that has shifted within the last three days. So initially it was 72 hours, it's now 24 hours, fever free without medication and improvement of all other symptoms for 24 hours. To return to school, the child must be transported to school by the parent and must be confirmed fever-free by the school nurse before eligible for school that day. Again, we're also going to set up the same monitoring systems that we're putting in place for students as, as for staff. They're gonna be required to take their temperature and report it on a daily basis, and they'll follow these same quarantine protocols that I've just outlined above. Our clinics are gonna serve as an isolation room for each building. Um, so the clinic for medication distribution, chronic health conditions, services for students injured during the school day. In the event of a positive, uh, in the event that a student or a staff member is show, showing signs of a fever or exhibiting COVID symptoms, uh, the clinic will immediately become isolated and that person will be taken there. Uh, we will uh, then, so it's gonna serve as both. When an individual exhibits symptoms at school, students must be immediately separated from others. Staff must be immediately relieved of their duties and sent home. District should designate an area, which will be our clinic, who exhibits symptoms to wait for parent and guardian for transport. The clinic will be closed and serve as our isolation room and thoroughly disinfected afterwards. Areas should be supervised by school personnel maintaining social distancing and or wearing PPE. If symptoms intensify before parent guardian transport, district may arrange for emergency medical transport. District should consider establishing a transportation protocol for situations where parent guardian has no transportation. We'll close off and thoroughly sanitize any and all areas of the building occupied by that individual exhibiting symptoms. So th this kind of goes along with the importance that I, I, I mentioned earlier about not only students and families in partnership with the school, but if they're demonstrating symptoms now more than ever, sending them to school could cause catastrophic spread. Um, you know, I, one of the physicians, I think it was two days ago, sent an email and that, that kind of exemplified that, that if, if, if one parent sent their kid who was hitting a fever of say 101, and they were COVID positive, but didn't know it, the spread in a given day could be immense. So again, my plea with all families is to be sure and monitor daily, report daily, but also if they're exhibiting symptoms to keep them home. The Franklin County Board of Health has indicated that best practice is to create a system where families and students report before they enter school. So that is why we're creating an app or using a Google form or Google doc. We have purchased face masks, and if a student were to show up without one, we will provide one for them. So again, if, uh, if exposed to COVID, and exposure is uh, under six feet for more than 15 minutes with or without a mask, you must quarantine for 14 days. Uh, check temperature twice a day, watch for fever and other symptoms. If no symptoms after 14 days, individual may return to school. Individual may return to school after all the following have occurred. They are fever free without the use of medication. And this is if they're identified with COVID for at least 24 hours. And again, that has changed from 72 to 24 hours uh, as recently as two days ago. 
uh, at least seven days have passed since symptoms first appeared, or if testing is readily available, individual with COVID tests but no symptoms may return to school after all the following has occurred. They continue to have no symptoms, 10 days have passed since positive test. They have two negative tests at least 24 hours apart. You know, so just, just point of order, um, you know, there, there, there may be some that believe that testing is readily available. Um, I can tell you that, again, the, the physicians that live in Grandview and Marble Cliff have indicated uh, as recently as yesterday that, um, that tests are waning and becoming more and more challenging to get. As mentioned, we're gonna have pretty rigid and strict hand washing, sanitizing protocols, and we're gonna have both a sensor activated wall mounted hand sanitizer in every classroom, as well as a, as a large vat of hand sanitizer that's just manually pump activated. And we're gonna require them that for every class period, they, they hand sanitize before and after, uh, as well as every hour in a, in a more uh, elementary setting. So we've shut down the traditional drinking fountain mechanism. However, all of our drinking fountains do have a water bottle filler and that the water bottle filler will be activated and available. So we do encourage students to bring a water bottle, use their own, do not share, uh, but the water bottle fillers will be activated. The traditional drinking fountains will be turned off. So in, the, in a hybrid model, um, Students will take a grab and grow lunch and go home for lunch. Uh, one of the biggest ways that, or, or biggest challenges in, in my conversations with the Franklin County Health Department, the biggest worries is, is lunch. And obviously you can't eat lunch with a mask. And one of the number one ways to prevent spread of COVID is to wear a mask. And so um, one of the benefits uh, in my judgment of the hybrid model that we've outlined is, is it mitigates lunch as opposed to an AB day lunch AB day rotation where students are in there are going to be eating lunch every day without a mask. Um, our hybrid model limits that. In all day school settings, students will get a grab and go lunch and they will be eating in their classrooms. We could use uh, the cafeteria for a limited number of classrooms as well to spread out students more while they eat. Um, this is recommended best practices by Franklin County Board of Health. Students are in, and will be encouraged if we're in a traditional school setting to pack their lunch when able. Students are encouraged to follow physical distancing as much as possible in the serving lines. Cafeterias can operate at a reduced capacity with staggered schedules as much as possible. Assign seats with, for every student that is eating in the classroom and if they're eating in the cafeteria in order to disperse students out further are a really important component of our plan. And the reason being is that in the event that someone strikes positive, having that assigned seat available when it comes to contact tracing becomes critically important. So our classroom furniture will be configured to allow for physical distancing of at least, at least three feet for students whenever possible. We've purchased uh, a lot of plexiglass dividers for every classroom, no sharing of school supplies or food. We'll have a no visitor policy unless there is an emergency and visitors who must enter in an emergency situation will be limited to the main office and must wear a face covering and follow all other required health and safety protocols. Um, I mentioned earlier in our distance learning plan that all interscholastic sports and extracurricular activities would be canceled. So in our hybrid model currently, um, our guidance with OHA, OHSAA is that sports would continue. Um, you know, we, we are continually monitoring this. And as recently as at today, today's press conference with the governor, he was asked specifically about sports. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get it exactly, which is always dangerous, but my take on it was that, you um, we're going to have to wait and see whether we can have sports this fall. So one of the questions that I do get asked uh, via email quite a bit is, since we're in or should we be in a hybrid setting, is there a way that we might be able to provide wraparound services 
for, you know, say K5, K4, K6, what, whatever the case may be. And so I did reach out to the owners of Little Dreamers, Big Believers, and we, we've had several meetings and uh, we will be partnering and have partnered with them. And they are able to provide AM, PM wraparound services opposite their school assignment. This includes uh, transportation. Um, so if, the, if, for example, if, if uh, my son Ben is in second grade and he goes to Stevenson Elementary and he's in the AM, PM setting and I sign him up for Little Dreamers, they'll transport him at the conclusion of his AMP day, AM day to uh, Little Dreamers, Big Believers. And uh, so he'll be there in the PM setting. Uh, I believe that there is even a nuance for PM attendees of Little Dreamers, Big Believers to include like a three o'clock cutoff or a 6 p.m. cutoff. And there may be a price differential, but really I, I may be speaking out of turn. So anyway, they're creating a, a scenario to provide that wraparound services. The services are, are inverted in the way that I described they would be for the AM student going to um, uh, little dreamers, big believers. In other words, they could, uh, they'll provide transportation, uh, say, you know, 1145 to Stevenson Elementary and drop them off to begin their day um, for the PM setting. This is an outside agency that will be running their program for our students and families. Um, and Kids Club will be sending another email out tomorrow uh, with the link to this information with more specifics. Uh, one of the new pieces of information that I uh, wanted to share today is that we have chosen to delay our start of the school for students. So the first day of school for students will be August 17th. We are originally scheduled to start on the 13th, which is a Thursday. Um, we are going to work collaboratively with our teaching staff, our para pros and our custodians uh, to professionally develop and prepare our staff and leadership team. So we're gonna have targeted professional development with regard to hybrid and distance learning for our teachers, preparation and collaboration around all the safety protocols I've shared for you today and what that would look like on a daily basis um, and what their role is in supervising that in all contingencies. Uh, opportunities for grade level teams and departments to plan synchronous and asynchronous learning with and for students and opportunities for our health professionals in collaboration with our principals to answer staff questions regarding any and all of the what ifs that they have and will have. There is a financial impact with regard to the reality of this situation that includes, and if you don't believe me, just ask Beth Collier, uh, masks, hand sanitizers, cleaning and disinfectant products, plexiglass dividers, and additional custodian, uh, along with a permanent sub in every building. So th there, there are uh, some financial implications to our district as a result of the pandemic and planning for this. I already sh shared with you in one of the first slides that adjust and adapt is going to be critical and that plans are and will remain at this moment. And that is to say, that we will continue to reevaluate based on evolving conditions, data based on status of the pandemic and recommendations and guidance for public health officials and scientific community. So with that, um, I'll take any questions from the board. Questions or comments from board members? I have a question. Uh, Go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, thank you, Andy, for... Uh, putting together that presentation, that was great, thank you. Um, I noticed for the Florida Virtual Academy, uh, making the decision, you mentioned July 29th. Yeah. Um, so the governor uh, comes out with the data on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And I, based on recent emails from parents, I think people are kind of, they wish that they could have online learning through our district mm -hmm. and they might adjust their decision based on if we're starting in a distance learning setting versus a hybrid. So I'm wondering if we could give them until that Friday, which would be July 31st. Yeah, I have no problem with that, Kevin, whatsoever, none. So part of our, um, so yes, to answer your question. And, right. and if I, do, do you mind if I expand on that a little bit? Um, sure. So part, you know, look, 
One, I do think we're going, no, we will be flexible. So I, I want to just maybe address transparently. Let's, let's for fun say that, um, you know, a, a family signs up for the Florida Virtual Learning Academy. And let's say two days before school is scheduled to start, um, not only are we in purple, but we're in purple times 10. And we move to distance learning. You know, we would accommodate the request to move from Florida Virtual Learning Academy to our distance learning uh, with and for parents and families, just first and foremost. Um, second of all, our desire and rationale behind selecting that date had, had more to do with, uh, had nothing to do with being inflexible or rigid, but everything to do with based on the number of families that sign up for that option, um, it, it could have impacts on our staffing capital outlay for teachers and uh, ratios with students. And uh, clearly, um, you know, that, that's important to us and we want to be able to monitor and plan accordingly. But yes, to answer your question, July 29th, I think you said, totally fine. So right now it's scheduled for the 29th, which oh, is- uh, What did you say? I'm so, so whatever you- Yeah, that's a Wednesday. So, so what date next, did you say? I can't remember. I'd like it to be the 31st, which that's would be totally, the July. Yeah. July 31st is fine. Great. I wrote it down even this time, so I won't forget. <laughs> Thank you. Kevin, actually, those, those were a couple of questions I had as well. Um, and, and what you specifically said there, Andy, about it, depending on, because we are getting indications that more people are going to select that online option than originally indicated in the surveys. And it would have to jump by a whole lot, I understand, um, to be at a situation where you could have an entire you know, class in a grade level to free up a teacher. But if that were to happen, if by some stretch of the imagination, all of a sudden we had 20 people per grade level enrolling in distance learning, it is on the table that we would perhaps re-examine what our plan is. Yeah, hundred percent. I, you know, <clears throat> so today when last, I, I, so I looked at it maybe four days ago. Um, so Chris Dice had run a, a spreadsheet by grade of those that had had definitively declared they were going to do Florida Virtual Learning Academy, and um, uh, you know it was like two, two in kindergarten, you know, right. three in first grade, you know, right. and I'm making this up by the way, you know, yeah. one in third grade. <laughs> Uh, zero, zero in fourth grade, you know, four in, you get the idea. It was very evenly distributed across K-12, which um, is fine, but with respect to our ability from a capital outlay standpoint, freeing up a teacher when it's distributed in that way, it's very difficult. Right. But we, Yeah, I, can, I no, completely understand that, but it was just, I think a lot of people are like, I mean, frankly, a little bit hopeful, like, well, you know, because that it would be like people's ideal, but I get that's economies of scale. This is one of those few instances where being a small district does not work in our favor um, when it comes to this option. But, um, yeah, so to, to, to answer your question, though, w part of why we're resending that out tomorrow and asking families to respond on July 31st is because uh, we want to have some time to look at that data and, and correspondingly make some uh, some decisions about what you're outlining. Right, and then this is a um, very specific question. I felt like originally some of the um, some of the things that were sent around were indicating that the option was the Florida virtual school. It was like, and, and now we're saying Florida virtual learning academy. And when you look online, there are actually two different things. So. Very specifically, which one is it that is our option? Because one is like FLVS and the other one is like Florida Virtual Learning Academy, which is operated by K-12 or something like that. It's the Florida Virtual Learning Academy. Okay. All right. Because I think there is some confusion in the community because there are two different programs in Florida that have very similar names. Okay. Um, and so who would, if people wanted to get more information, another thing that I'm seeing is a lot of people are curious, but given that it is not run through directly by Granby schools. They wanna know more information about the school and are feeling like they're not getting enough through just perusing um, 
a website? Who can answer questions for people that they have specific questions? Yeah, so, so great question. So part of what we do plan to do is in the email that we're going to send out tomorrow, we're going to uh, send the exact link to their website, as well as provide uh, some more background analogous to what I put in this presentation. Um, you know, I would say the two right now people that have the most knowledge of it would be Chris Dice and Jamie Lusher. So our chief technology officer and our chief academic officer have done the most research around this topic and are most familiar with it. I, you know, I would say our three principals as well have done some research, but those two, um, I think, are... So, and, and, and Andy, if I could request, I know that we'll send that out to the community, but uh, along with that presentation being on the website, perhaps information about the Florida school, and then also the, the link to, to sign up should be there also. I know sometimes I get an email and it just particularly these days can get lost and, right. and you know have that our website as a place that folks can go and get. Yeah, that. so we'll, we'll include the link in not only, we'll include the link in multiple locations as well as on our website. Great, and can I and just one follow up email. say again? And in our follow-up email to the community. Oh, and one last thing, if whenever we change colors, um, how much, so the governor's been doing that on Thursdays, mm -hmm. um, where we reevaluate what color each county is. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we switch on Monday or like how long, how, what leeway is there in transition times? Yeah, so that's a great question. We've had some, um, some early conversations around that. Um, I believe the data, I, as, as I understand it, the data comes on Wednesday, the governor announces it on Thursday or updates on Thursday. And it would be my thinking that um, from Thursday to Monday uh, is when we would potentially make a switch. Okay, thank you. Uh, quick, quick follow up on Emily's point. Um, I'm wondering if when you send out the email or, or take information about the virtual academy, could we specifically ask parents, because I think there will be a difference, if they plan on choosing option two, which is the fully online through the, through the Florida virtual school, um, or if it was possible to have a class, so say 20 kids within a grade level, would you choose that? Because I think you would get different numbers. You're on mute, Andy. Yeah, part, part of the challenge is, you, you know, you have to know uh, A in order to get to B. Um, and in the absence of knowing A, I mean, I'm, I'm processing out loud here, by the way, Kevin, so I'm open to your insights on this. Um, in the absence of knowing A, I'm not going to know whether B is even an option. Is right. what I'm struggling with. Well, I would think it'd be like, I, I hear what Kevin's saying. It'd almost be like a hypothetical. Like, you want your kid to learn online, but you're not comfortable with the Florida virtual school or whatever it's called. And um, But if there were a district-led virtual option, you would have chosen that. You would prefer that over hybrid or, or all day, every day in school. Mm -hmm. but does that make sense? It does. I, I hear where he's coming, but I get your challenge too. Yeah. So, so maybe there's a way we can structure it in the, um, in the email. Um, we're using forms to send this email. So maybe there's a way we can ask a question like, um, here's what I'm worried about, or I'm wondering maybe is a different way to say it. Um, like if, like I, what, one of the things I'm wondering is, is maybe there might be a family that wouldn't choose for Florida Virtual Learning Academy. But if we were able to free up a teacher to uh, potentially do distance learning for, you know, a grade level or a grade band, they would opt for that. Is that That's that, yeah, uh, yeah, I understand, but what I'm trying to, you know, so I, I, we'll work on that. I, I, get, I got what you're saying. Yeah, let, let uh, Jamie, Chris, and I and the principals uh, work on that. I, I, got I what think within saying. that, I mean, you've got to be a little bit realistic about that looks different at different grade levels. So uh, in grades six, seven, 
through 12 really where where someone has multiple teachers you know um if 20 algebra one students are doing that where are the chances their schedule line up to go through so just just to be completely honest i i think that's a a good viable data point with probably k5 maybe mm -hmm. k6 um i mean the reality is you know do we even like that would be nearly impossible to, to work 612 so do we want to even um enter that realm or, or or tell folks there's a possibility when when really there's there's probably not and I, I so to me there's a there's a real distinction and it really comes down to you know the amount of teachers uh that a, that a student you know has in a day and then you know you may have the option of being uh with a grandview heights teacher if there are enough kids but you might not be able to get the special so there there's a lot of nuance so i, I think we just need to understand i think it's a great data point to get um just the realistic structural end. Um, you, there, there, there may see some points where that can go in effect, but but I but I think um, realistically being able to do that sort of wholesale K twelve is is a is a is a is a little chance. Honestly. I totally I totally agree. And I just I think it's a great data point, but I think you know <laughs> we need to be honest about what the what the options uh, could and could not be. I think you'd lose the flexibility as well of being able to pop back in. But I do think for those K-5, that's a phenomenal question and, and um, is, is worth some getting some data points on. But I also wonder, you know, just when it comes to staffing, that that would be a challenge to say, well, which, which staff member, how do you select which staff member does that? Which one's going to be in the classroom and which one's going to be doing a virtual classroom? Um, I don't know the ins and outs of contracts with that and how that would work. And that's certainly a true consideration. I, I, I would say if you if you look closely, and I know you have, uh, at that AMPM model, you know, we're already sort of by subject level making some of those split determinations. Um, so, you know, and that's one of the reasons I can tell you when, when Andy talks about uh, this teaching staff being flexible and willing to work like that, uh, they have and in, in, in other places that has been uh, much more of a challenge. So, um, you know, we, that when, <laughs> when when he thanks the teachers for their flexibility, I, I know that's uh, that's that's sincere because we're not getting uh, many of the roadblocks that other districts may be having around those exact questions because it is difficult and you want to teach your employees fairly, but you you've got to set up a structure that's best for our kids. So, um, Andy, thanks for the presentation. And there's one point that I want to dwell on just a little bit because uh, there was you know many slides with a, a whole lot of information to, to absorb within all that and I'm just trying to think of this you know we've had a chance to to go over it and kind of absorb but you know certainly for some parents um, there's a lot coming at you um, one thing I, I, I guess I did want to just really say is that the intention here um, is for a full year of learning for all of our students. Uh, and I think that can get lost. Um, I, I, one of my worries about the, um, the communication part, so not really the education part, but the, the communication part about a hybrid where we were saying, you know, AM, PM is that, um, you know, somebody could easily look at that and say, oh, my kid's going to AM school. So they're getting a half day worth of school and they're learning half as much during the year. And I think the intention really is not to make that the case that every child will get a full year of instruction. Uh, we're trying as hard as we can, just like every year, to make sure that each student has that individualized learning, you know, and makes that that progress for the whole year. And um, uh, and, and you know, frankly, we'll involve activities uh, uh, on the the off day. In fact, I don't even like I, that's it's the wrong way to put it. It's you know the, the day of school learning that's not in person, it's the, or the afternoon of school learning that's not in school building, but it is at home. So uh, just wanted to, you know, clarify that a little bit and give you the chance to talk about, you know, for uh, a parent who's um, hearing this and is thinking, you know, well, you know, are they really just saying, you know, it's a half day or it's only half as much uh, learning? Um, thinking about the different grade levels, because it is different from a first grader to a sixth grader to a 12th grader. Um, what are some of the things that the school will be doing to ensure that, you know, 
even in the hybrid model or the online model that um, kids will get the, the, the full day and the full year of learning. Well, in, in essence, what you just said is without a doubt, our full intention and we are fully optimistic that we'll be able to accomplish a full year of learning with our intended learning outcomes on an annual basis in all subjects, in all grade levels. Uh, you know, I think some of the strategic things we've done, for example, in the K-5 schedule is we've uh, prioritized, you know, reading, writing, math with for the in-person and, and um, which will help us maximize in particular at those early grade levels, those subject areas and the related arts are gonna occur opposite of when they're in school. Um, so there's an there's a intentionality and an example of our attempting to be strategic about uh, the in-person instruction and maximizing that time. I think also, Eric, you know, um, one of the things that we really struggle with as a leadership team was this AB day rotation where you are uh, either every other day in school, every other week, two days or three days, or in some cases, a week on, a week off, or in some cases, A through K, Monday, Tuesday, everyone's off Wednesday, L through Z, Thursday, Friday. There is, without a doubt, in my view, uh, in terms of this notion of putting, a, 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 in, putting an importance on academic press, uh, because of our hybrid model and students being present every day, uh, it definitely puts a premium on learning and our ability to actualize that in a given year relative to other districts hybrid plans, I think is going to, uh, I think it's far superior than a lot of when what a lot of other districts uh, came up with. And part of our rationale, among other reasons, again, I mentioned the lunch earlier, but uh, academic press and ability to be in person every day uh, from an academic standpoint was one of our core rationale for why we chose the hybrid model that we did. Jamie, I don't, I don't know if Dr. Lush wants to add anything. Jamie, do you want to add anything to that? I do think Molly's been wanting to speak. No, no Andy, I, I totally agree. I think that was very well said. And I think, uh, you know, certainly articulated in a way that I, I just share you know, the intentionality in terms of how we are structuring the day to maximize the opportunity to hit the what I would consider to be the foundational skills for our youngest learners, but then ultimately too to give flexibility for our folks at the higher levels, um, especially when we think about AP courses, to be able to use that split block within the schedule and the structure that we've designed. Um, and I, I know that it's asking a lot of our community to think about things beyond, um, you know, what would be I consider to yeah you know, like a, a structure that would give you a full day. If, so to speak. But when you think about the whole child and you think about the needs of our youngest learners and access and foundational skills, and then also meeting the needs of our kids at an AP level, this one absolutely gives us the best leverage to be able to, to, to do that. Well, thank, thank you both for that. I just want to maybe recognize the difficulty. Um, I mean, I think it'd be very easy uh, to say, well, we can only do so much. And so instead of doing this, we're just going to, you know, fill the bag halfway and because that's all we can do. And I think really trying to, to maximize the education. Um, it, it's hard for the teachers. Um, it's hard for the students. Um, it's going to be a hard year for them. You know, uh, there's just no way around it. It's an obstacle and it's hard for the parents. And, I, you know, I just say that to recognize that I think, you know, all of us realize that this is not an easy choice. You know, we're not trying to say it's going to be an easy time, but we're, you know, we really are trying to, um, you know, maximize doing the best for education for all the students in the district. Um, I kind of want to follow up too with what Dr. Lesher had to say and what Mr. Culp had to say. I did have a question about lunches. so. I'll circle back to that. Um, Mr. Bode, it's a very good point, and sometimes things get lost in communication where it's like it's only a half day. Um, when we um, look at the other hybrid schedules that are in Franklin County, and I say this with no equivocation, we have one best. Like, there's so many unique opportunities, and with this, I look at it as there's a silver lining. And with this, 
the students get to learn the material in the classroom and then they get to practice it at home, it's hard, but the actual learning is, there's a lot of failures, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of that, but that's, that's the actual learning process and that's something that our kids will still be allowed to do. Like the Thomas Edison quote where there was, I learned 17,000 ways to not make a light bulb. You, this is what, with this hybrid option, it's we're front loading it and our kids get the unique opportunity to learn and work through it. And we have the top gun of teachers where they're gonna plan, this is what happens with this kid that doesn't know it, this is what the kid that got it before they came in. And with that, like, I wanna say this and I, it sounds kind of weird, our hybrid model pedagogically doesn't, it doesn't miss. Like there's, I don't think of it as like, like I don't, this is good teaching. And we're in the middle of a pandemic and our leadership team and teachers have come together to do this. So I wanna say kudos to them because it's when we read through what's going on in Franklin County, I'm like, yes, Grandview did it well. And I'm very, I, the hybrid model is, it, there's the childcare and the parent aspect of it, which I don't, I'm not sidestepping that, that's hard. But for our kids, with where we are at, I think there's zero doubt in my mind. We have the absolute best. We don't have busing. We're meeting the American Pediatric Association with the kids are there every day. So I, I kudos to our leadership and the, the educator in me. And I say this, I'm completely jealous that I don't get to teach in this situation. I would love to teach in it. It's, it's so good for our kids. It's the best of the worst, and there's some silver linings in it, which is hard to believe that there's some silver linings, but there are. With that, with our hybrid model with AMPM, the AM kids will have a chance to do grab and go lunches. What about our PM kids? Are they grabbing and going and going home? Like, Yeah, great question. That was about oh. So one of the things that we did this summer is, is we, we opened up our cafeteria and we still provided breakfast and lunch. And what we ended up doing after a couple of weeks was we provided a grab and go option for, uh, so like on Mondays, we did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, so they grabbed and go, they grabbed and, and went for, for, with three lunches and three breakfasts. And then on, on Wednesday, they could come and grab for Thursday and Friday. So in this scenario, what our plan would be, would be, the AM kids would grab and go at the conclusion of their day, each day. The PM kids at the end of the day would grab and go their lunch for tomorrow. Now, the first day of school, that's going to present some challenges. So we might have to work out that logistical piece. However, uh, that's our current trajectory. I had an additional follow-up to Eric's point about the hybrid being kind of a half day. Um, and you may not know the answer to this. This might be a question for little dreamers, big believers. Um, will kids that get the wraparound care have the opportunity to do their PM or AM work at the facility? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and it's one I asked of the owners. Um, and she, so it's been a bit since I've talked to her, full disclosure. I, I personally haven't spoke to her probably in maybe a week and a half. Um, but I asked that very question. I said, look, the reality is, is that we're going to have synchronous and asynchronous learning occurring um, while they're with you potentially. And so, uh, you know, it would be ACEs if we could work in partnership such that we're supporting learning. Um, while she didn't fully commit that, she, she didn't say, oh, 100 percent. She said, Absolutely, we'll look at it and we'll, we'll, we'll look to partnership, something along those lines. But, you know, she didn't say 100% yes. So, um, again, I don't want to speak for her. They've been great. Uh, you know, I've had two meetings with them and both went very well and they, they, they were very collaborative. So, and, I, and, and my kids um, didn't go to uh, Little Dreamers, Big Believers. Uh, they did go to daycare. They went to uh, Bears, a place called Bears. Um, but, but anyway... Um, so I'm not familiar, did I, I didn't know the owners until, uh, until this first meeting, but my sense is yes, um, to answer your question, but, you know, I'm, I'm a little leery of giving a hundred percent commitment to your question only because, um, you know, for lack of a better word, they don't work for me. Right. 
Well, yeah, I think their, their Wi-Fi capacity might be challenging. Yeah. Uh, but I'm optimistic that they will. I mean, to me, it's, it, it could be a win-win. It could be a win for their program. Uh, it could be a yeah. win in terms of enhancing their curriculum and a win for us. So uh, it would shock me if at the end of the day, they don't. And, well, and possibly we could work with them in terms of whether or not we create some sort of packets for the kids if the Wi-Fi compatibility is problematic with so many kids. 100%. Okay. If I could jump in, if, if I may suggest and, and push back, if you don't want to do this as a board, this is a lot of really good discussion. Um, you know, we're essentially having a discussion about Mr. Culp's presentation, which is in essence an action item that, uh, you know, we can discuss at that time. I would like to suggest at this point that we go through, um, get to that action item. Um, and then really the reason I'm suggesting this is I, I'm really interested in hearing the public comments we do have several folks that uh, wanted to speak before that action item. And then that gives us a, a chance as a board to have heard that feedback as, as, we, as we deliberate and consider uh, approving Mr. Culp's res recommendation. So if there's no objection, I certainly don't want anybody to feel cut off, but I'd like to move forward in order to, to follow that sequence of events if that is good with everybody. Okay, uh, with that being said, um, thank you. And uh, we do have, five sets of minutes to approve uh, quickly. Uh, special meeting on June 18th, regular meeting on June 24th, special meeting on July 2nd, special meeting on July 8th, and special meeting on July 13th. Could I hear a motion to approve uh, minutes A through E as just listed? So moved. Second. second. <laughs> I think Kevin was the motion and Eric was the second. Uh, Beth, could you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gephardt. Aye. Mr. Gousset. Aye. Mr. Truitt. Aye. Ms. Wassman. Aye. So at this point, as we get into uh, the part right before the action item, which is um, the recommendation the board approve the Grandview Heights plan for learning 2021 as contained in the packet and as um, presented by Mr. Kopp, I would like to uh, offer folks that would like to speak to that action item. Uh, once again, I won't read the full statement, uh, but please remember to state your name and address for the record. Uh, please remember to limit your comments to five minutes or less. Uh, direct your statements to the board. Uh, do not mention students or staff by name and remain, uh, please maintain reasonable decorum. Uh, the board is certainly happy and, and anxious to hear these statements, but will not uh, answer questions or engage in debate uh, during this, this board meeting. So. Uh, Ms. Hesed, could you go ahead and uh, line up our, I believe we have four um, folks for public comment. Yes, sir. Our first person um, who would like to um, address the board is uh, Juliana or Juliana Christ. Hi, thank you, Mrs. Head. Uh, my name is Juliana Christ, uh, 1243 Glen Avenue. Just by way of quick background, um, we are a two-parent working family. We have a rising kindergartner and a rising third grader. Just to start out with, I wanna say a, a really sincere, heartfelt thanks to everyone here. Um, this is a very hard, very thankless job and I'm sure you're getting um, inundated with frustrations and comments and I'm just so thankful for your thoughtful leadership. Um, it's hard to bear this burden publicly and you're, um, just doing it really wonderfully. And I really wanna, want you to know how much we appreciate it. So I have uh, two comments and one quick request. My, my comments are based on um, the district's plan that's being presented tonight, which um, asks for the school to pivot between different options depending on public risk factors and public risk ratings. So as you surely know that kind of a plan will require um, families to essentially plan for all options, depending on what risk level we're at in any given week, um, which is okay. I think that's the life that we're in right now. We're gonna have to do that no matter what. Um, but I would make a suggestion that um, perhaps the district could consider whatever the initial option is. So whatever we are doing on day one, as long as it doesn't, it's not a crazy high risk level four scenario, I would ask that the board consider committing to that option for some period of time, maybe six to eight weeks, just to give families um, certainty. I think there's value in predictability um, so that we can make work arrangements and childcare arrangements. As you may already know, um, Bexley School District is 
um, has indicated that they plan to stick with their initial their initial model for the first nine weeks, just to give parents and staff, frankly, a little more time to plan and a little more predictability. So um, I would put my head in the ring for considering something like that. Uh, my next comment is um, just a suggestion, which it sounds like is going to happen tomorrow about resurveying parents uh, who are thinking about keeping their kids at home. I would join that chorus of voices that you have heard, it sounds like, who are telling you that there are a lot more families who are considering keeping their kids at home than you may know about or that may have responded to that initial survey. I would also encourage um, the district to consider making adjustments and perhaps new options based on the outcome of that survey, just as Kevin and Emily were talking about. I can tell you anecdotally, there are a lot of families who want to keep their kids home, but who would much prefer, much prefer a grand view virtual classroom to the Florida school. And I would also add for your consideration that there are also families who right now, given the option, would choose hybrid over the Florida school. But if they knew there was a grand view virtual option, they would actually choose that over the hybrid. So I think it's a good middle option. And if you're considering tweaking that survey, um, consider how you can work in those families as well. Um, I think a grand view virtual classroom, let's say if you have 20 first graders who are gonna stay home, it keeps their instruction local. You know, our teachers are the best. Uh, it keeps them tied to their friends, to their school, to their community. It's more social. And it also, I think, facilitates a better transition for those children to go from virtual classroom to in-person classroom. If we ever get to a level one situation where everybody's back at school, those kids already have a class. They're already in the curriculum. They can make that transition really easily. Uh, my last comment is more of a request. It's just something I hope the board members would consider speaking to prior to their vote tonight. I, I think uh, regardless of tonight's outcome that process is important. And I, I really truly feel that the more uh, confidence I think parents and staff have in the board's um, deliberative process, the more content I think they can be with the ultimate decision, even if it wasn't their first choice. So I know a couple of weeks ago, July 8th, the board um, wasn't prepared to vote at that time and tonight they will be. So I just ask if you would consider speaking to what your deliberative process has been between now and then. Um, some things to consider is, you know, what information have you been digesting and maybe who have you been discussing with? Have the board been discussing options with each other, with community experts? Have you been deliberating independently? I just think it would be very helpful and also frankly reassuring for the public uh, to maybe hear not just what your decision is, but how you reached it. And I think that will help people um, regardless of what the decision is, just to really have some contentment with it. So I would ask that you consider sharing that info with us. And that's it. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Chris. Our next um, per person who would like to address the board is Robin Amacon. Ms. Amacon. Sorry, I was muted. Hi, Robin Amacon, 1186 West First Avenue. I have an incoming kindergartner and um, I just wanna start by thanking the board, especially Superintendent Culp and everyone here. They, you've actually answered a lot of my questions that I planned on asking. And um, Ms. Chris too, you had two of my exact questions that I was gonna ask. Um, I too um, am leery of the online academy. Um, I have an incoming kindergartner. I have concerns about even if we do hybrid, that those little ones are gonna keep those masks on. <laughs> Um, and and I, I think a lot more parents are considering that option now, at least that's what I've heard. I personally couldn't answer that initial survey and I'm aware that a lot of other parents couldn't too. I even had a couple of parents tell me they didn't even receive it somehow. So I don't think that's a full representation really of some of the parents' desires in the district. Um, I know everyone would love to have a Grandview teacher do it. I understand that can be difficult. Um, you know, we'd have a, have a certain number of parents request that and, and for the district to have the funds for that. I wonder if the district has considered any other kind of Zoom or other kind of virtual in-person live streaming classes that they could do from, you know, just inside the classroom so it could all happen at the same time. <clears throat> I think that would maybe be a better option too, but um, I'm just wondering if that's something you've considered. Um, my other question has to do around 
testing. Um, I understand retesting is not going to be a requirement and I understand that could be an issue with just logistics and capacity of testing at this time. Um, my concern is just, you know, every other industry, I work in a law firm, we have to have two negative tests before we re return to the office if we test positive. I feel like we're setting a lower standard for our children and our teachers, which gives me some worries. So I feel like if we don't have adequate testing, maybe we shouldn't consider even sending our kids back at this point unless we have that testing capacity. So that's really it. I'll turn it on to the next speaker. And um, I, I, again, I appreciate everyone's comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Hamacon. Next individual to address the board is Patricia Zettler. Hi everyone, I'm Patty Zettler, 1241 Malford Road. I apologize for uh, missing the Zoom link earlier. I hadn't received it when I was called on earlier. So, uh, you know, an embarrassing uh, student-like feeling there. Um, so I'm a parent of a rising first grader and a three-year-old who I lost the audio. Is that true for everybody? Um, the audio was lost. I can reach out to her via uh, email, Mr. Truett. Can we just try to send her a chat and see if she responds? like the way Dr. Lusher sent the Florida Virtual School link. I just sent her a chat to let her know we lost her audio. She's actually fully off now. Um, give it a quick second. You know, a, a, a suggestion might be we move to the next speaker and come back to her. She's back now, we can try and add her. Let's add her, and if not, let's uh, follow Mr. Culp's lead. Patty, you uh, you can talk again. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm using my work Zoom um, through Ohio State, and I've been having trouble with it all day. So um, I think it's, you know, I guess this is what we all deal with these days. Um, but um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I just want to, I, and I appreciate the time and I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, you know, I want to offer some comments, um, both from my perspective as a parent and as a parent in a household with two working parents, but also in my professional life at Ohio State, um, I'm a faculty member who works on public health law and regulation. So I spend a lot of, if not all of my time right now thinking about COVID. Um, so, uh, you know, I think many of us really are very anxious for some certainty. And, and I think we all share the view that nothing can replace the educational value of our children being in person. And I'm one of the people who enthusiastically responded, yes, I will send my kids in person when we got that survey several weeks ago. But, you know, this is also a very fluid situation and, and my comfort level is quite different now than it was then in part because as we all know, the COVID numbers continue to get worse. Um, and so um, I want to share, I guess, two specific questions. Um, first, it's really critical to me that teachers and staff feel safe and that they feel that their perspectives are part of the decision and that they have a choice in how to do their job safely in their judgment. Um, and especially hearing what I think I heard from the Education Association at the start of the meeting about teachers feeling more comfortable with the delayed start date. I'm wondering um, if the board could talk a bit more about why the proposal is to delay the start of school only a few days and not say until after Labor Day or, or a few weeks or something like that. Um, I, I'm wondering in part because I wonder if a, a more delayed start might buy us some time and maybe even some certainty if the mask mandate that the governor announced today um, helps reverse trends that we're seeing in COVID infections in the area. And for what it's worth, you know, for my you as a parent, I think it would be very difficult for my son to be in person for a brief time and then have another shutdown. I think it would be easier to start online and, and ramp up to in person for him, at least. Um, and the other, I guess, thing I, I'm curious to hear more about is, is the plans for health screening. Um, I really appreciate the plan to have health screening and, and the plea from Superintendent Culp for sick teachers, staff, and children to really stay home. Uh, but I wonder if we could hear more about why the plan is not to have staff at school do screenings for fevers. It strikes me as just really a lot to ask 
to put that burden on families right now when there's so much pressure and so much economic uncertainty. And for those of us with small children, you know, that probably means a lot of people are going to feel like they really, really have to go to work no matter what. Um, and, and I also wonder what the school is planning to do about the fact that we know um, asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people spread the virus. So what steps um, the board is considering to uh, maybe ask families and children who opt for in-person learning to agree to do things like not engage in voluntary high-risk activities or do other things because we know pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic spread um, is, is um, you know, happens. Um, so um, those are sort of my two, the two questions I'd love to hear more about. Thank you again for all of your work. Again, apologies for the um, uh, technical difficulties. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm just very appreciative for the time and for your work. Well, thank you for those, those comments. And, and please don't apologize on the technical end. I think um, every single person has faced that quite a bit recently. So uh, certainly, under, certainly understand that. Um, Mrs. Head, I think we have um, one more. Is that correct? That is right, uh, Mr. Truett. We have one more um, member of the community who would like to address the board, and it is Melissa Palmashana. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Good nod. Okay, perfect. Melissa Pomigiano, 1376 Windot Road. Again, like everyone else, I wanna thank Mr. Kalb and Dr. Lusher and the entire administrative team and school staff for their work on both the plans this past spring and this summer. And I also, I also wanna give a shout out to the Board of Education members having sat in your seats in the past. I know that there's maybe five people that have talked on this call, but the amount of feedback that you're receiving privately and via email is voluminous. And so thank you for taking the time to digest all the information and the emails coming in from the communities, people all over the place on this specific issue. And then obviously this is a, a unique situation where the, the, just the public information available about COVID is voluminous and changing um, at the rapid rate. Uh, so going on to my first point, I think um, for full disclosure, I would send all three of my kids um, all day, every day, if that were the, the option um, at this point, because I'm so concerned about what the American Academy of Pediatrics said about the mental health wellness, the physical wellness, and other concerns that we all share for our children um, due to the sudden shutdown of schools in the spring, and the, we're somewhere in the 120 some days since they've been in school. Um, I also want to, along those same lines, that I haven't seen anything to say that we can maximize and personalize every child's learning in any of these models except for the full in-person model. And so I think whatever we can do to continue to work to get back to that traditional setting, um, we owe it to the kids in the district to do that. Um, and I will say from online learning, I know a lot of the parents that have talked tonight have younger kids. And I will say having kids that kind of spread the, the age difference in the three schools, which has happened to work out this year, third grade, sixth grade, and ninth grade. Um, even your highest performer, most diligent, most disciplined learner, which we have one of those, um, she struggled with online learning because she just didn't like it. And her retention, she will say it is down. Um, the other kids, I'm not sure, um, the youngest doing, you know, in K3, I think the the efforts to waive fees for all the parents of kindergartners, I think speaks to the fact that that's a real challenge at the K-3 level um, to educate children uh, virtually. So again, um, I do believe that there is a way to have schools open and care for students and staff well being at the same time. I don't think that that's a mutually exclusive proposition. I think that we have gotten it wrong from the beginning um, as far as considering certain industries essential. I happen to work in one. And so I am dealing with COVID day in and day out. Um, and we haven't deemed education essential. And so I would really like us to start thinking about education as being essential and how we get students back in the classroom and get them you know, achieving those intended learning outcomes. Um, so third, I hate to throw a question in there because having sat in your seats, um, as far as the plan, I know the board is planning to vote on the plan and Andy was very specific. I wrote it down he says, the county alert levels um, put out by the governor are gonna be an indicator, but not the indicator. And so I'm interested in knowing what other factors may be considered if we're not gonna be just stuck in level three, red, we're hybrid. 
and I heard a parent say, oh my gosh, we have to be in, do we have to be in level one to go back to in-person learning? I didn't hear any Mr. Culp say that. So if you could um, clear that up, at least before you vote on it, at least have some ideas of what the other indicators may be so that we're not fully reliant on the Franklin County data. And then the last, uh, the last ideas I wanna throw out there is on the, the gap closing. I know I was on the board during a period of time when there's a lot of discussion about um, different economic conditions for people in the community and having read a lot of the forums out there, I happen to have not heard of a parent that doesn't, doesn't want their kids to go back to school full time. So I guess we all have different groups of um, people that we associate with in the community. But as far as gap closing, there's people trying to find private tutors trying to do alternative curriculum, what plan we have in the future to close the gap. Because I think that if we're in hybrid or online learning situation, there's no way that each of our students, um, both K-3 level are gonna reach those intended learning outcomes by the end of the year. And so are we talking about going through spring break if COVID situation clears up? Are we talking about extending into the summer? Um, and then also the mental health access. I know a lot of people, a lot of kids are struggling all age levels with the uncertainty. And um, when they hear tomorrow that they're not going back to school full time, I know there's gonna be a lot of broken hearts out there. Um, so thinking about uh, mental health access and how we're gonna get options out there. I like the Wellness Wednesdays, but something that's um, making sure that kids know that, that they have options and people to talk to and um, think of that kind of the extra cleaning. I think it's one of those extra things that we all could probably use right now, some extra mental health um, support, just like extra PPE. And then again, focusing on how we can, you know, how we're going to close the gap because we worked really hard to get, you know, curriculum re realigned and get really strong academic press in the district. And I know that everybody's losing it, but I'm just not willing to throw in the towel on the kids and accept that as being well, it's just because of COVID and let's find a way to manage through the crisis and um, educate the children to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody, whether it was at the beginning of the meeting or just now that, um, that provided those comments, uh, certainly uh, insightful and, and frankly, um, not really off topic from a lot of the thoughtful comments that have come to us as a board of administration and to um, Andy's leadership team. Um, I, I do appreciate that uh, sort of professional tone and, and tenor and, and thoughtfulness that, that people have brought their comments to. Um, with all that being said, we are at the point in the agenda where I think the board can sort of, um, frankly, just restart the conversation we were having around uh, Mr. Culp's recommendation uh, to the board. I, I would like to, to speak uh, quickly um, just, you know, about, about the process to get there. Um, you know, I can say as far as what deliberation the board has had between the last board meeting and now, uh, the deliberations we have are what you see during the board meetings. You know, we, we don't have a, a mechanism nor are we allowed to, um, you know, really have decision-making discussions uh, outside of a board meeting with, with the Sunshine Law. So really the, the main factors that, that have happened between then and now is receiving um, a lot of information and asking questions of our district administrative team. And from a matter of process, it's uh, Mr. Culp and his team that brings us a recommendation to either you know, approve wholesale, approve and tweak, or reject and send back uh, based on sort of that feedback and questions. So, um, you know, a lot of a lot of discussion with um, with um, feedback from the community, from survey results, from the Education Association and the, and the Teachers Association. And also, we haven't mentioned, quite frankly, a lot of legal advice that, uh, you know, what do we do to mitigate liability as a board in our district? You know, boards, boards can make, a, make some decisions that really put our district district administrators in, in harm's way and about uh, what sort of medical advice you, you take and don't take. And, and frankly, uh, a lot of the legal opinion in our direction is to follow the Ohio Department of Health and Franklin County Department of Health. And, and frankly, um, not to be an outlier and be, um, be um, less restrictive than, than other districts from legal liability. Nothing is clear cut and says you should do A, B, or C uh, to be fair, but um, that's essentially what what's happened between 
between um, uh, the earlier in July board meeting and and where we where we are today. Um, and a lot of those points. And I'd also like to make a point that you know we are at a moment in time, and and uh, Mr. Culp and and uh, Dr. Lesher and Chris in this call and principals have been working very hard. And you know this is hard to hear. Uh, some of the questions we don't have answers to because we're still figuring it out, and our team is still figuring it out. So um, right, wrong, or indifferent, um, that's a reality. And so I think the team's working very hard, and we'll continue to see a lot of communication out and. FAQs out to, to do that, but, but I think that's 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 a key. Um, so I'd like to sort of redirect the board to the discussion around the um, the, the presentation and the recommendation that, that Mr. Culp presented, and see if there were any other comments, uh, questions, or discussion from my colleagues on the board. One one quick comment, Jesse. Um, I was just going to mention we we convened a health and safety committee before the uh, before the last board meeting, so it wasn't exactly between. But we have been getting a lot of information from the health and safety committee, and I just kind of want to throw a shout out uh, to them for their for their. Work. Uh, if I could, they were advised not to. Yes, I believe that our last speaker yeah. is muted. Told you that. Um, yeah. That's fine. Right. Thank you. Hey, yeah, hey no. Chris, Melissa, we need to mute you just as an FYI. Or Chris, I don't think they realize that. We can hear them. Melissa, if you can mute, or Chris, if you can politely move her out. Uh, she's not in right now. Well, we're. I'm hearing her. Okay, it's muted. She's muted. All right, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Say. Once again, as one of one of our public comments said, you know, we, we're all sort of learning our our, our technical engine. So, um, Kevin, please, if you could remake that point. Um, did you ask me to repeat what I said? Uh, yeah, please. Oh, sure. Um, so I, I agree with uh, Mr. Truett. We haven't necessarily convened as a board. However, we have been receiving information from the Health and Safety Committee, um, and that has been extremely helpful. Um, and I really want to just commend them on their efforts to assist us. Right. Um, be very specific um, back to Andy's presentation and the all day every day um, plan what happens with recess in that because I don't think it was I don't think you've talked about it before in previous meetings but is it it's, it wasn't specifically identified I don't believe in your PowerPoint I think you're right actually so that was one of the specific topics when we met with the Franklin County Health Department for them to review our plan and give us recommendations about our plan, uh, which I believe was a week ago today. We specifically talked about recess and um, quite frankly, their guidance was intuitive. I mean, intuitive, at least to me, who's been living and breathing in this, in this world now for the last uh, six months. So six foot social distancing, hand sanitizing before and after recess, uh, limit, uh, shared uh, activities or games with, uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, don't, don't be, don't, don't have a, a, a baseball or a, a large ball that you're transferring back and forth to many hands and people are touching. So try and devise activities for kids that don't include a common uh, ball, for example. Um, clean and sanitize play equipment uh, regularly. Uh, cohort as recess, which is to say, uh, make sure that the, the students that are going to recess are the same and that you have clarity on who those kids are. Again, so if one of them uh, hits with COVID-19 positive, you're able to contact Trace. Um, so so those, were, those were the recommendations. And was there anything specific to masks at recess? If you're in an outdoor setting like that, would they maintain masks at recess yeah, or would so that be a mask break? Yeah, so that's a great question, Emily. Um, we actually discussed that also, and they did encourage masks, mask breaks in particular in that K4, K5 grade band and outdoors. They also encouraged it for the mask break to be outdoors. So yes, that would be part of the recess experience. Thank you for that. Thank you, Emily. And I think one of our... Um, one of the, the people who spoke brought this up and I, and I do think it would allay some concerns to the community. If you could explain just a little bit more about how 
the plan that you've presented would follow the county color coding system, but that little caveat there about what other indicators. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, full disclosure, I think that, and in, in I don't know, I, I believe it was the last board work session, you know, this board deliberated about whether to link to that or even for it to be part of what we used as criteria and kind of where we landed, uh, at least my recollection on where we landed was, is, you know, consult with the Franklin County Board of Health, ask them, if we don't link to that, what criteria will we use? What measures will we use? And so, as mentioned, just recently, we met with the Franklin County Board of Health, Joe Mazzola and three others on his team. Joe's the director. Um, there wasn't also an MD doctor present and assigned to Franklin County Board of Health. And I asked them, I said, listen, you know, we're, we're kind of back and forth on whether we should or shouldn't link. Basically, all the other districts in Franklin County have. What criteria can I use to determine which plan is best for Grandview if we don't link? And in essence, the response was a resounding Andy, I'm telling you as strongly as I can, in the absence of any other criteria, this is the best criteria that you have. And we strongly recommend that you do link your varying options to the governor's color coded plan. Uh, so, so then my next question was, well, you know, first off, I said, thank you, Joe, appreciate that. So my next question is, well, what other criteria can we use? And in essence, the answer was, well, that would be local criteria. So for example, uh, during the school day, a seventh grade student contracts a fever, is sent to the clinic, sent home, we disinfect, we send the teacher home and the students that they have been involved with, he is hits positive COVID, we contact Trace. It may be, it's that kind of localized data that's individual to the student, the situation, uh, here at school that would cause us to potentially go from a, in this instance, a hybrid setting to a distance learning setting. That distance learning setting based on the fact set could be for that class, it could be for that grade level, it could be for that building, and it could be for that district. Those decisions are gonna be made in collaboration with the Franklin County Health Department uh, based on the specific situation that avails. So I think, and, and to be clear, this is an important point, and, and Mr. Kalt, um, you and I have discussed this, and so tell me if I'm not seeing this right, but when we have that caveat of it's an indicator and not the only indicator, uh, let's be clear that what we're talking about is we would follow that indicator or become more protective. Like, I don't see a situation where we're in red and we open traditional based yeah, on- I, Yeah, I, 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 that's, ex yeah, exactly right. I, I, and, and frankly, um, you know, the legal advice is not to go that direction from the Franklin County Health or we're, we're, we're opening ourselves up to, to um, the district to some serious potential liability with that. So, you know, let, let's be clear. And I, and I think some people may honestly be holding on to, well, you know, if, if we have local data that says our situation's better, then maybe we can do X, Y, or Z. The, the second piece, and, and we just need to be realistic is, you know, um, we're, we're all following the health data, we're following the articles, we read a New York Times article that says one thing and a Wall Street Journal article that says something else and, and, and listening to our own medical professionals in our community. But there's also just what it takes to operate a school. Um, and, 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 you know, I know this firsthand as do other, other board members. And if you show up one day and you're short three staff members and suddenly you're short three staff members for, for three weeks, you know, in the past, whether we like it or not, if you don't have a fifth grade teacher, you take those kids and you disperse them in the other fifth grade classrooms or fourth grade classrooms. But if for social distancing, you can't do that, you know, there's a potential that operationally, we may hit a limit and have to have to go to full distance learning, even if the rating system would say hybrid or open. I, and, and I would predict not to be on a soapbox that that's a, that's a very real possibility that I think we need to be open with. And I think it's also important to understand and rightfully so, our employees have uh, protection, federal law protection built in. That doesn't mean teachers have necessarily tested positive for COVID-19. Folks have a right in additional sick time if they're caring for a child that doesn't have full-time school. You know, they're, so, I mean, you know, think about that. If they're caring for a spouse, if they're caring for a mother and father. So, you know, it's not just hey, we have teachers that have contracted COVID-19 and we can't have school. There's a very 
high likelihood that at a certain point we can't distance because of the staff we have. And that's why we've made a financial investment in building subs that are specific to our building, not traveling to buildings across the county um, every day, whether we need them initially or not. So we have that to try to relieve that pressure. And I know other folks can cover class, but I think, I think that's another reason to talk about why we're not tied to that scale. And I think, um, I mean, we could run scenario after scenario after scenario, but, but spending our career in school operations, I, I can tell you, um, that's highly likely to, to, to happen. And I think um, we just need to be honest with folks that, that there's everything that we're doing and there's just operating a school safely. And if, if we end up in a situation where we don't have the staff to operate the school safely, we're not gonna be able to. And Jesse, you know, I wanna weigh in here a little bit too. Um, and uh, I know you and I have talked and, and, and Andy, I've heard, uh, you know, your excellent points and, and want to say that I, I agree with what the was stated in the resolution that um, it's an important factor it's not the only factor so I think you know there's consensus around that um, I, I think personally um, that uh, I, I do think that our district is different than other districts that uh, there are local factors I think there's some very important things like the fact that we have no transportation uh, you know school buses um, that we are small, um, so a little bit more nimble, uh, that we have a higher degree of technology. Um, there's just certain things that I think, and uh, more space, um, I think, than a lot of other schools as well within the school buildings. So um, I think of it a little bit like snow days, you know, the same snowstorm hits everybody and a lot of school districts close um, and we're still open. Um, you know, it's usually us and Bexley are, are the outliers. Um, I could easily see that as we get further into this, that there's going to be different school districts across Franklin County and across Ohio that choose different paths. And I think that is probably appropriate, just like, you know, the governor said. So, um, and I also, what's, uh, I, you know, the last, uh, I think, full meeting we had, we talked about um, some of the, um, you know, desires. And that was, you know, a lot of things have happened medically since then, but um, I think there was a wide recognition for the, the idea that uh, in school all day is the best educationally. Um, it's also the one that we're built for. It's what our, you know, our um, teachers have taught for many years. So I think there's some real advantages. So again, I, I think, um, you know, uh, as we go through the year, there's just so many factors. Who knows when a vaccine is going to come? Who knows, you know, when the curve is going to go up and the curve is going down? Um, I just don't want to telegraph at this point that, yes, we've made a decision that, you know, if it's red, it's going to be this. I think there's just going to be a lot of factors. And uh, personally, you know, I, I, I so much want to get to that point um, of being able to open the school all day. Uh, I hope we get to a situation where it's safe to do that. Um, I'm comfortable with the fact that right now, um, you know, as, as if, if you know, if we're opening the school today, um, it would not be the right thing to do given where Franklin County is now. But um, I really do hope we get to that. And um, I wanna keep considering that as we go forward. Thank you. And, and I, I think it's important um, to, to understand um, you know, our last board meeting, we sort of said we need to, we can talk about three models all day long, but we, we, we've got to give, give our families a sense of, of where we are at this moment in time. And, you know, data points may change, advice may change, medical professionals may change. So, um, you know, this is not a, this is not a one and done on the, on that behalf of the school board to just stand back and say, well, there's a plan for the year. Um, you know, we continue to, to work diligently for, um, you know, what's, what's best for our kids. Um, any other questions or discussion from the board? Um, is there a motion to approve uh, A1, the Grandview Heights School Plan for Learning 2021 uh, that was presented by Mr. Kalp with the adjustment of uh, from July 29th to July 31st uh, for the initial decision for uh, folks that want to explore the virtual academy. So moved. Second. Um, discussion and Andy, please make sure that PowerPoint is updated before it's sent to the community and um, put oh, on the right now. So 
it's a lot going on. So I don't mean that to be insulting. Um, any other further discussion from the board on the recommendation from Mr. Paul? No further discussion. Beth, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Um, thank you. Um, there's a second item under uh, recommendations from the superintendent, which is a resolution for remote learning. Just as a point of clarity, uh, the State Department is requiring that districts and community schools turn in remote learning plans at this point, you know, if we would end up in a situation where we do distance learning at some point during the year. So it's just, it's prudent to do that now. Um, that's really not an indication of, of what we're doing or not doing. It's just getting, <laughs> frankly, I, it's a bit of a compliance item so that can be turned into the state. So if we're in a situation where we have to go full distance learning, that's done. Um, I think I have a motion to accept the, um, the resolution for remote learning plan uh, A2 in our agenda. So moved. Second. 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 Any questions or discussions on the remote learning plan resolution? Beth, please call the roll. Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gephardt. Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Um, we, cert we have one item under board policy and procedure, uh, face coverings, uh, final reading um, in the appendix. If I could have a motion for B1A, uh, face coverings policy for the district. So moved. Second. Any questions or discussions about that policy? Um, it was addressed in the PowerPoint, but uh, uh, legal counsel advised that we adopt that as a separate policy. No questions, Beth, could you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Um, there are five items under business and finance uh, in the board agenda and in your packets. Could I please hear a motion for C one through five, the budget reserve transfer, all day everyday kindergarten, then and now certification, food service, adult meal price and budget adjustments. Uh, so moved. Second. Any questions or discussions? And Beth, thank you. Uh, even though I'm not an administrator there you know, at this point, but thank you for being flexible with those then and nows. I'm sure as things are flying this summer, you're probably getting more of that. And and uh, so I, 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 you know, I appreciate uh, your flexibility with that. And, and, and or, Jesse, I do want to point out the all day kindergarten piece. Um, <laughs> yeah, is just that um, uh, if, you know, if we are in a hybrid or distance learning situation, that we would not be charging uh, for someone who signs up for that, for the all day kindergarten, they would not be paying. Um, it would be only if we move to the all day every day that we would start to charge. And Beth will have to do a little flexibility there, um, you know, if we move in and out and, um, you know, some logistics, but um, do want to make sure that parents understand that um, as, uh, as the intention going forward for this year. So thank you for that clarity. And I think it's, um, I appreciate the finance committee bringing that. So it's clear to parents how that, how that will work. I think that's, uh, that's important, particularly as we're in a time of lots of financial uncertainty in addition to educational uncertainty. And can I add to it, maybe Beth, you can clarify that when it comes to that piece that you and or Angie Allum will be clearly communicating with those parents exactly when that is expected of them and how that will go out. Yes, that's correct. So Mrs. Ollum and I have already drafted an initial letter that will go out to, to kindergarten families tomorrow morning um, that explains the, the process. Um, they have, have all made their initial deposit when kindergarten screening was done back in February timeframe. And so the letter explains that we will hold that deposit um, and apply it to any charges if there are um, if we are back in a traditional learning setting at any time during the year, and we will communicate each month with them to let them know um, the status of that. So we, we do have a plan to, to, um, to do that. Any other questions and discussions on the items for business and finance? 
If not, Beth, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Um, we have two items under personnel, uh, transitional hours and a contract addendum. Could I have a motion for D1 and 2? So moved. Second. Questions or discussion? Beth? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Any other items for discussion from the board? Well, uh, Andy, Dr. Lusher, Beth, and your entire team on behalf of the board, I uh, wanna thank you for all the work you're doing. It's, it's um, normally when there's a, a big decision in front of us, uh, you know, there's a sense of relief when it's done. And I, I certainly don't have that sense. And I don't think anybody on this call does, uh, you know, we're parents first and, and, and wanna continue to move forward. Um, we certainly appreciate all the feedback we've had thus far and um, anticipate and welcome to continue to get that feedback moving forward. Um, I'm sure that, that items, um, you know, as, as situations change, we will continue to need to be fluid, but I think it's, um, I thank you all. I think it's very proactive to, to be where we are today and, and give folks a real sense, uh, whether you agree or disagree, um, sort of where we're sitting today and, and our thought process. So um, on behalf of the entire board, Mr. Kalp, we thank you for, for all, all of your um, hard work and your team's hard work uh, moving forward and, um, you know, are appreciative that we're doing uh, this work here and nowhere else and, and certainly um, appreciate the, the professionalism, uh, the communities uh, coming with this uh, with, some, with some very good feedback. So a you lot know, to consider, I'm, a lot to continue to consider and I know that everybody on the Zoom meeting um, takes that responsibility seriously and, and, and um, you know, and, and will continue, will continue to do so. I'm sorry, Mr. Cole. I'm going to steal a line from the district attorney who is, uh, did a press conference yesterday with regard to Larry Householder. It's the end of the beginning. I'm afraid so. So uh, with no other discussions, do I have a motion for, oh, sorry. Sorry, Molly. No, I, I wanted to say um, on behalf of myself, not speaking as the board, I really wanted to thank the community the medical professionals that have sent emails that I think not only do I have an education degree, but now I have a medical degree from the amount of time and effort that they have put into talking to us as just reaching out genuinely. Science has based a lot, um, a lot of what they have sent to us. And I and I, I wanted to say also to the community, I know, and I'm going to speak all five of us. These, these are our kids. These are, we're trying to do the absolute best for them. I, I would imagine that there's not a person on this call right now that has had a good night's sleep and I'll go six months, but the last two, three weeks, like the, the commitment of Andy call Beth Collier, Dr. Lusher, the teachers, the district leadership, I couldn't be prouder to support all of you. And I couldn't be prouder of this community and the way that we have all discussed this. This is hard. We're in a pandemic. No one ever tells you how to handle this. Um, I, I couldn't be prouder of the work that we're put in and our, our kids are gonna be okay because of everyone, and I'm doing this because I'm looking around, like everyone on this call, everyone, Grandview is a great community because we care about our kids, we care about our education. And all, every single one is, I want my kid to do well. I want these students to do well. You don't always have that. And I, I wanna say thank you to the community and thank you to everyone around this call. Like, I know I say it, almost all the time. I'm like, Grandview is amazing. And I think when you hear the comment, the, the calls, the emails, I just, I want from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And a special thanks to, to the leadership and the time that they have put on. I have, I have no problem putting my child in their care 
because they will do their absolute best. Our teachers are amazing. But I thank you. Thank you from the very bottom of my heart. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for those comments. With that, do I hear a motion for adjournment? I move. Move. Wait, who, somebody had that for, who was that? Eric can take it, I'll take a second. All right, I think if that's okay, Eric has the motion. Mr. Gousset, you have the second. Um, no other discussion, Beth, could you please call the roll? This is Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gephardt. Aye. Mr. Gousset. Aye. Mr. Truitt. Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth. Aye. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.